Now, moving on to our next topic is using Google for reconnaissance. Now, some people also call this Google hacking. Now, if you know how to use Google to exactly target and find what you are looking for, Google is an excellent tool for reconnaissance purposes. And today I'm going to show you how you could use Google exactly for your searches. So first of all, let's open a tab of Google. Um, let's open up here. So let's go to Google.com. OK, so now we're going to be talking about how we can use Google to actually gain some information or some targeted information. So this is in general called Google hacking. Now, when I say Google hacking, I'm not meaning by breaking into Google to steal information. I'm talking about making use of specific keywords that Google uses to get the most out of the queries that you submit. So, for example, a pretty basic one is the use of quotations. You quote things in order to use specific phrases. Otherwise, Google will find pages that have instances of all those words rather than the words specifically together in particular order. So I'm going to pull this query up and this shows a list of let me just show it to you. So if you go index off now this is showing us an index of all the films now this is basically all those index of sites that you want so as you guys can see this shows us an index of all sorts of films that are there now you can use the index of and you see that we have also an index of downloads or something like that hyphen.com slash download and it is an index of all sorts of stuff now you can go into some folder and check them out G. Jones, G. Worthy, G. Perico. I don't know what these are, but some sort of stuff. And this is how you can use Google. Now, let me just show you some more tricks. So you can use this. So suppose you're using Google to find for something like a presentation. So you could use something like file type PPTX. And it'll search for every type of file there that is PPT. OK, let's try some other side, dot PPT. So config. OK, so this brings up all the types of files that have some configs in them. So this is some gaming configuration, as we see. This is some digital configuration of Liverpool. Now, you could also use something like this thing in URL. And you could use something like root. And this will give you all the things with root in their URL. So kingroot.n, digital trends, and how to root Android. So that's in the root. and Suppose you want to say something like all in file type, or suppose you want um, some extension. So, so dot pbt dot pbtx. Does that work? Um, let's search for JavaScript files. Okay, I think it's JS. Okay, that doesn't seem to work either. This shows us all the things with JS in it. No, it's just external JS. I'm doing this wrong. So you could use file type. So let's see, file type, and we go, let's see, doc. So these are all the documents that you could find with the file type thing. And you could also do JS, I guess. Yep, and this will give you all the JavaScript files that are there. So this is how you can use Google to actually narrow down your searches. So suppose you want a particular set of keyword, and we want to make sure we get the passwords file from Google. OK, so now let's go into more details about the various things you can find using Google hacking techniques. Now, while Google hacking techniques are really useful for just general searching in Google, they're also useful for penetration testers or ethical hackers. You can narrow down information that you get from Google. You get a specific list of systems that may be vulnerable. So we can do things like look for error pages that do in the title error. So I'm going to get a whole bunch of information. So suppose like we go in title and we say error. So as that, we get all sorts of stuff. And we can do the minus Google part. So if you do a minus Google, it'll not show you the stuff that's from Google. So we get various documentation pages about different vendors and the errors that they support. So here's one doc about Oracle, about Java error. If you know something more specific, we may be able to get errors about all sorts of other stuff. So this is how you could use the Google hacking technique to your own advantage if you're a penetration tester. Now, let's also show you something called the Google Hacking Database. Now, this is very useful for an ethical hacker. Now, the Google Hacking Database was created several years ago by a guy called Johnny Long, who put this Google Hacking Database together to begin to compile a list of searches that would bring up interesting information. Now, Johnny has written a couple of books on Google Hacking, so we're at the Google Hacking Database website here, and you can see them talk about Google Dorks and all sorts of stuff. Now, you can see that we can do 
all sorts of searches like in URL, SAP, BC, BSP. This brings up some portal pages. Now, out here you can bring up some password, APS password in URL. Now, this will give you all sorts of stuff on Google. So suppose you go in URL, so like APS password. Now, you can get all sorts of stuff like which have passwords in their URL. So maybe you can just guess a password from there too. Now that was Google hacking. So Google hacking entries and they also have a number of categories and that you can look through to find some specific things. So you may be interested in, of course, and you can search specific information that you may be looking for with regards to a specific product. For example, let me just show you exploit database. These are all the types of stuff you can go through out here. And as you see, we have all sorts of stuff like this is an SQL injection thing. This is something regarding peer archive TARS. So these let you get a foothold into some password cracking attempts and you can do some brute force checking and you can see here if it talks about the type of search it is and what it reveals. You can just click here on Google search and it will actually bring up Google with a list of responses that Google generates. So let's look at this one here. This type is a log. So this is something about cross-site scripting logs and we can also see some party logs if I was not wrong. So there's some denial of service POC and we can see a bunch of stuff and if you continue to scroll down there are a lot of interesting information in here so somehow somebody's got a party log that has log a lot of information they've got it up on a website and it's basically a bunch of information that you can see you can also get some surveillance videos sometimes and you can look into them and this is basically how you could use google so it's basically a list of queries that you can go through and this is a very useful site if you are a penetration tester and looking for some help with your Google hacking terminologies. So that's it for Google hacking. Now let's move on. Okay, so now it's time for some networking fundamentals and what better place to begin with TCP IP. Now we're going to be talking about the history of TCP IP and the network that eventually morphed into the thing that we now call the Internet. So this thing began in 1969 and it spun out of this government organization called ARPA, which Advanced Research Projects Agency. And they had an idea to create a computer network that was resilient to a certain type of military attacks. And the idea was to have this network that could survive certain types of war and warlike conditions. So ARPA sent out this request for proposals to BBN, which is Bolt, Baranek and Newman, and they were previously an acoustical consulting company and they won the contract to build what was called the ARPANET. The first connection was in 1969. So that's where we get the idea that the Internet began in 1969 and the Internet, as we call it now, didn't really begin, but ARPANET did. And ARPANET has a long history that goes through NSF net in 1980s and after ARPANET was sort of decommissioned. And a lot of other networks were folded into this this thing called NSFNet that then turned into what we now call the Internet. And once a lot of other networks were connected into its first protocol on the ARPANET, initially there were 18 to 22 protocols, which was very first protocol defining communication on ARPANET. And it was called 1822 protocol because BBN report 1822, which describes how it worked shortly. And after that, there was this thing called the network control program. And the network control program consisted of ARPANET's host to host protocol and an initial control protocol. Now, there's certainly not a direct correlation or an analogy here, but if you want to think about it in particular, where you could say that the ARPANET host to host protocol is kind of like UDP and the initial connection protocol or ICP is kind of like TCP. So the host to host protocol provided a unidirectional flow control stream between hosts, which sounded a little bit like UDP. And ICP provided a bi-directional pair of streams between two hosts. And again, these are not perfect analogies, but the host to host protocol is a little li bit like UDP and ICP is a little bit like TCP now. Now, the first router was called an interface message processor and that was developed by BBN. It was actually a ruggedized Honeywell computer that had special interfaces and software. So the first router wasn't a ground up built piece of hardware but it was actually an existing piece of hardware that was specially purposed for this particular application. So Honeywell had this computer that they made out and BBN took that and made some specific hardware interfaces and wrote some special software that allowed it to turn into this interface message processor, which passed messages over ARPANET from one location to another. So where did IP come in here in 1973? 
So I became in here as well in 1973, as I just said, and a guy by the name of Vint Cerf and another guy by the name of Robert Kahn took the ideas of NCP and what the ARPANET was doing and they tried to come up with some concepts that would work for the needs that the ARPANET had. And so by 1974, they had published a paper that was published by the IEEE and they proposed some new protocols. They originally proposed a central protocol called TCP. Later on, TCP was broken into TCP and IP to get away from the monolithic concept uh, that TCP was originally. So they broke it into more modular protocols and thus you get TCP and IP. So how do we get to our version 4, which is IPv4, since that's the kind of internet that we're using right now. Version 6 is coming and has been coming for many, many years now, but we're still kind of version 4. So how did we get here between 1977 and 79? And we went through version 0 to 3 by 1979 and 1980. We started using version 4 and that's eventually became the de facto protocol on the Internet. In 1983, when NCP was finally shut down because of all the hosts on the ARPANET were using TCP IP by that point in 1992, uh, work began on an IP next generation. And for a long time, all of the specifications in the RFCs talked about PNG eventually and IPNG became known as IPv6. You may be wondering where IPv5 went. Well, it was a specially purpose protocol that had to do something with streaming and certainly not a widespread thing. One of the differences between IPv4 and IPv6 is that IPv6 has a 128 bit address, which gives us the ability to have some ridiculously large numbers of devices that have their own unique IP address. IPv4 by comparison has only 32 bit addresses. And as you probably heard, we're well on our way to exhausting the number of IP addresses that are available. And we've done a lot of things over the years to conserve address space and reuse address space so we can continue to extending to the point till where we completely run off IPv4 addresses. Another thing about IPv6 is it attempts to fix some of the inherent issues in IP. And some of those has to do with security concerns. And there are certainly a number of flaws and IPv4. And when they started working on IP next generation or IPv6, they tried to address some of those concerns in some of those issues. And they may not have done it perfectly, but it was certainly an attempt. And IPv6 attempted to fix some of the issues that were inherently in IP. And so that's the history of TCP IP till where we reach today. Okay, so now that we've discussed a brief history on TCP IP and how it came about to the TCP IP version 4, let's discuss the model itself. Now we're going to be discussing two models and those are the OSI model and the TCP IP model. Now, as I said, we'll be talking about the OSI and TCP models for network protocols and the network stacks. OSI, first of all, is the one that you see out here. It's the one on the left hand side of the screen and OSI stands for Open Systems Interconnect. And in the late 1970s, they start working on a model for how a network stack and network protocols would look originally. The intent was to develop the model and then develop the protocols that went with it. But what ended up happening was after they developed the models, TCP IP started really taking off and the TCP IP model was what went along with it and matched better. What was going on with TCP IP, which became the predominant protocol. And as a result, the OSI protocols never actually got developed. However, we still use the OSI model for a teaching tool as well as a way of describing what's going on within the network stack and the networked applications. You'll often hear people talking about different layers like that's a layer two problem or we're under layer three space. Now continuing through these lessons, I'll refer occasionally to the different layers. And when I do that, I'm referring to the OSI model. So let's take a look at the OSI model. Starting from the bottom, we have the physical layer, which is where all the physical stuff lives, the wires and cables and network interfaces and hubs repeaters, switches and all that sort of stuff. So all that sort of physical stuff is sitting in the physical layer. Now sitting above this is the data link layer and that's where the Ethernet protocol, ATM protocol, frame relay, those sort of things live. Now I mentioned the switch below the physical, the switch lives at layer one, but it operates at layer two. And the reason it operates at layer two is because it looks at the data link address and the layer two or physical address and that's not to be confused within the physical layer. It does get a little mixed up sometimes and we refer to the MAC address. Now the MAC address is not the physical address that I'm talking about. It is the message authentication code address on a system as so uh, the MAC address on a system as a physical address because it lives on the physical interface and bound physically. However, that MAC address or media access control address lives at layer two at the data link layer. The network layer which is right above at layer three 
that's where the IP lives, as well as ICMP, IPX, and from IPX, SPX suite of protocols, from novel routers operate at layer three, and at layer four above that is the transport layer. That's the TCP, UDP, and SPX again, from the IPX, SPX suite of protocols. And above that is the session layer, and that's layer five, and that's Apple Talk, SSH, as well as several other protocols. And then there's a presentation layer, which is layer six, and you'll often see people refer to something like JPEG or MPEG as examples of protocols that live on that layer. Then there's a presentation layer, which is the final layer, which is layer six. And you'll often see people refer to something like JPEG or MPEG as examples of protocol that live at that layer. And then they live at that layer, which is the presentation layer. Finally, we have layer seven, which is the application layer. And that's HTTP, FTP, SMTP, and similar application protocols, whose responsibility is to deliver and the user functionality. So that's basically the OSI model, and that's the seven layers of the OSI model. And there's some important thing to note here. That is when we are putting packets onto the wire, the packets get built from top of the stack down by from the top of the stack to the bottom of the stack, which is why it's called a stack. Each layer sits on top of the other, and the application layer is responsible for beginning the process. And then that follows through the presentation session and transport layer and down through the network data link until we finally drop it on the wire at the physical layer. When it's received from the network, it goes from the bottom up and we receive it on the physical and it gets handled by the data link and then the network and till the application layer. So basically when a packet is coming in, it comes in from the application, goes out from the physical and then when it's going out also, it goes from the physical through the data link then the network, transport session, presentation, and application, and finally to the target system. Now what we're dealing with is an encapsulation process. So at every layer on the way, down the different layers, add bits of information to the datagram or the packet. So that's when it gets to the other side. Each layer knows where its demarcation point is. Well, it may seem obvious each layer talks to the same layer on the other side. So when we drop a packet out onto the wire, the physical layer talks to the physical layer, and in other words, the electrical bits that get transmitted by the network interface on the first system are received on the second system. On the second system, the layer two headers that were put by the first system get removed and handled as necessary. Same thing at the network layer. It's the network layer that puts the IP header and it's the network layer that removes the IP header and determines what to do from there and so on and so on again. While it may seem obvious, it's an important distinction to recognize that each layer talk to each layer while it may seem obvious, it's an important distinction to recognize that each layer talk to each layer. And when you're building a packet, you go down through the stack. And when you're receiving, you come up through the stack. And again, it's called a stack because you keep pushing things on top of the packet and they get popped off the other side. So that was detailed and brief working on how the OSI model is set up and how the OSI model works. Now let's move on to the TCP IP model, which is on the right hand side. And you'll notice that there's a really big difference here. That being that there are only four layers in the TCP IP model as compared to the seven layers of the OSI model. Now we have the network access layer, the internet layer, the transport layer, and the application layer and the functionality. Now we have the access layer, the internet layer, the transport layer, and the application layer. The functionality that the stack provides is the same. And in other words, you're not gonna get less functionality out of the TCP IP model. It's just that they've changed where different functionality decides and where the demarcation point between the different layers are. So there are only four layers in the TCP IP model, which means there are a couple of layers that have taken in functions from some of the OSI models, and we can get into that right here. The difference between the models at the network access layer in the TCP IP model that consists of the physical and the data link layer from the OSI model. So on the right here, you see the network access layer that takes into the account the physical and the data link layers from the OSI model, on the left hand side, similarly, the application layer from the TCP IP model encompasses all the session presentation and the application layer of the OSI model. So on the right, the very top box, the application layer encompasses the session presentation and application layer. And on the left hand side, that of course leaves the transport layer to be the same. And the OSI model, they call it the network layer. And in TCP IP model, it's called the internet layer. Same sort of thing, that's where the IP lives. And even though it's called the internet layer as compared to the network layer, it's the same sort of functionality. So those are the really big differences between OSI and TCP IP model. Anytime I refer two layers through the course of this video that I'm going to be referring to the OSI model and in part because it makes it easier to differentiate the different functionality. If I were to say layer one function in the TCP IP model, you would necessarily know 
if I was talking about a physical thing or a data link thing, since there's more granularity in the OSI model, it's better to talk about the functionality in terms of the layers in the OSI model. And that's the predominant model, the OSI model and the TCP IP model for network stacks, network protocols and applications. Okay, so now that we've discussed the TCP IP model, let's go over another important protocol and that is UDP. So what you see out here on your screen right now is Wireshark and we'll be going over the uses of Wireshark and what it's useful for in the uh, upcoming lessons. But for now, let me just show you a UDP packet. Okay, so before we get into um, the analysis of the packet while it's still filtering, let me just tell you a little bit about UDP. So UDP is a protocol in the TCP IP suite of protocols. It's in the network layer. That's the network layer in the OSI. So a seven layer reference model, the IP network layer carries the IP address and that has information about how to get packets to its destination. The transport layer sits on top of the network layer and that carries information about how to differentiate network layer applications. And that information about how those network application gets differentiated is in the form of ports. So the transport layer has ports and the network layer has, in this case, an IP address. And UDP is a transport layer protocol. And UDP stands for User Datagram Protocol and it's often called connectionless or sometimes unreliable. Now, unreliable doesn't mean that you can't really rely on it. Unreliable means that you can't trust that what you send is reaching the other side. So what means actually that there's nothing in the protocol that says it's going to guarantee that the datagram that you send or the packet that you send is going to get where you want to send it. So the protocol has no sort of safety feature like that. So you shouldn't use this protocol that is UDP if you want some sort of safety net. And if you needed that type of safety net, you would have to write it into your own application. So basically UDP is a fast protocol and that's one of the reasons why it's good. It's also one of the reasons why it's unreliable because in order to get that speed, you don't have all of the error checking and validation that messages are getting there. So because it's fast, it's good for things like games and for real time voice and video, anything where speed is important and you would use UDP. So right here, I have a packet capture. So I'm using Wireshark to capture some packets and let's check out a UDP packet. So out here, you see that there are some frames that says 167 bytes on wire, 167 bytes have been captured. But we're not really interested in the frame part. We're interested in the user datagram protocol part. So out here, you can see that the source port is 1853 and the destination port is 52081. Now it has a length and it has a checksum and stuff. So as you guys see out here, well, we don't really see a bunch of information. What you only see is the source port and the destination port, the length, and there's also a checksum. So UDP doesn't come with an awful lot of headers because it doesn't need any of the things that you see in the other packet headers. The only thing it needs is to tell you how to get the application on the receiving host. And that's where the destination port comes in. And once the message gets to the destination, the destination needs to know how to communicate back to the originator. And that would be through the source port or a return message. So a return message would convert the source port to a destination port and send back to that port in order to communicate with the originator. So we have a source port and destination port and the length is a minimal amount of checking and to make sure that if the packet that you received is a different from the length that's specified in the UDP header, then there may have been something wrong. So you may want to discard the message to check for more messages. So the checksum also makes sure that nothing in the middle was tampered with, although it's if there's some sort of man in the middle attack or something like that, a checksum is pretty easy to manufacture after you've altered the packet. So you can see here in the message that there's a number of UDP packets. Some of them just say UDP. The one look at happens to be from some Skype application, I guess. So talking to Skype servers and we've already got the DNS. Now DNS also needs some fast response times because you don't want to send a lot of time looking up information about servers that you're going to before because just to go to them. So DNS servers throw out, throw out their queries onto the wire using UDP hopping to get fast sponsors. They don't want to spend a lot of time setting up connections and during all the negotiating that comes with a protocol like TCP, for example. So here you see that the DNS is using UDP and what we've got here is another UDP packet with port destination and all sorts of stuff. So you can see it out here. So you can see the checksum, it's unverified checksum status. So you can check out all sorts of stuff using Wireshark. So that was about UDP or the user datagram protocol.
Okay, so now that we're done with the use data gram protocol, let's talk about addressing modes. So addressing modes is how you address a packet to your different destinations. So there are three kinds of addressing modes. The first kind of addressing mode is unicast. This is a pretty simple one to understand. So there is one destination and one source, and the source sends the packet to the destination. And it's it depends on the protocol that you're using to actually address. So if it's something like TCP IP, you're probably using a bi-directional stream. So the blue computer can talk to the red computer and the red computer can talk back to the blue computer. But you can also use a UDP stream, which is like one directional stream. So it's I'm not sure if I'm using the correct word. So it's a stream that's in one direction. I guess I'm driving home the point here. So if it's UDP, only blue is talking and when blue stops talking, then red can talk. But if it's TCP IP, blue and red can talk simultaneously at the same time. Now moving on, there's also broadcast. Now broadcast means that you are sending your packet to everybody on the network. So broadcast messages are very common from mobile network providers. So when you get those advertisements saying something like you have a new postpaid plan from Vodafone or Airtel or something like that, those are broadcast messages. So it's one server that is sending out one single message to all the other systems. Now there's also multicast. Now multicast is like broadcast, but selective. Now multicast is used for actually casting your, your screen to multiple people. So something like screen share when you are doing it with multiple people is multicast because you have the option to not show a particular computer what you are actually sharing. So those are the three modes of addressing unicast, broadcast and multicast. OK, now moving on, let's look into the tool that we just used to understand UDP. That is Wireshark. So what exactly is Wireshark? So this utility called Wireshark is a packet capture utility, meaning that it grabs data that's either going out or coming in of a specific network. And there are a number of reasons why this may be useful or important. One of the reasons why it's really important is what's going on in the network is always accurate. In other words, you can't mess around with things once they're on the network, or you can't lie about something that's actually on the network as compared with applications in their logs, which can be misleading or inaccurate. Or if an attacker gets into an application, they may be able to alter the logging. Now, several other behaviors that make it difficult to see what's really going on. And the network, you can really see what's going on once it hits the wire. It's on the wire, and you can't change that fact. Now, once it hits the wire, so what we're going to do here is a quick packet capture. So let me just open up Wireshark for you guys. So as you guys can see, I have already Wireshark open for us. Let me just remove this UDP filter that was there. So Wireshark is recapturing. So let us go over the stuff that you can see on the screen. Some important features of Wireshark so that we can use it later. So what I'm doing here is a quick packet capture and I'm going to show some of the important features of Wireshark so that we can use it later on. Now when we're starting to do some more significant work, I select the interface that I'm using primarily, which is my Wi-Fi and I'm going to be go over here and we'll bring up a Google page so that we can see what's happening on the network. So let me just quickly open up a Google page. As you guys can see, it's capturing a bunch of data that's going around here. Now let me just open up a Google page and that's going to send up some data. Let's go back. So it's grabbing a whole bunch of stuff off the network. I'm just going to stop that. I'm going to go back and go back and take a look at some of the messages here. So some of the features of Wireshark, as you can see on the top part of the screen, here there's a window that says number, time, source, destination, protocol, length, and info. And those are all of the packets that have been captured. And their numbering starting from one and the time has to do with being relative to the point that we've started capturing. And you'll see the source and destination addresses and the protocol, the length of the packet and bytes and some information about the packet. The bottom of the screen, you'll see detailed information about the packet that has been selected. So suppose I'm still selecting this TCP packet out here. So we can go through the frames. The frame also has some interface IDs, the encapsulation type and all sorts of information is there about the frame. Then we can look at the source port, the destination port, the sequence number, the flag set, the checksums. We can basically check everything about a packet because this is a packet analyzer and a packet sniffer. Now you'll see some detailed information about the packet that has been selected. So I'm going to select, so as I've selected this TCP IP packet, we see that in the middle frame, it says frame 290. It means that it has a 290 A flag packet and the packet that was captured is 66 bytes. And we grab 66 bytes and it's 528 bits later. 
So you, what you see out here was the source and the destination MAC address of the layer to layer address. And then you can see the IP address of both source and destination and it says it's a TCP packet and gives us a source port, destination port. And we can start drilling down into different bits of the packet. And you can see when I select a particular section of the packet down at the very bottom, you can see what's actually a hex dump of the packet. And on the right hand side is the ASCII. So this is the hex, the hex dump and this is the ASCII that you're looking at. What's really cool about Wireshark it, is it really pulls the packet into its different layers that we have spoken about, the different layers of the OSI and the TCP IP model. And the packets are put into different layers and there's a couple of different models that we can talk about with that. What Wireshark does really nicely is it demonstrates those layers for us as we can see here. It is actually four layers and in this particular packet here we can also do something. So I've got a Google web request so what I want to do here is I want to filter based on HTTP. So I find a filter. So let's see. We can do an HTTP. And what I see here is it says text input and it's going to get an image. So that's a PNG image. And this is a request to get the icon that's going to be displayed in the address bar. So you also see something called ARP out here, which I'll be talking about very soon. So let just the filtering be done. Now in the web browser, it's a favicon.ico that I can do here. I can select, analyze, and follow TCP streams. You can see all the requests related to this particular request, and it breaks them down very nicely. So you can see we've sent some requests to Spotify because I've been using Spotify to actually listen to some music. Then you can see all sorts of stuff like this was something to some not found place. So let's just take the Spotify one, and you can see that we get a bunch of information from the Spotify thing at least. Uh, you can see the destination, the source, it's an Intel Core machine. So the first part of the MAC address, the first few digits is, lets you tell if it's what what is the vendor ID. So Intel has its own vendor ID. So F496 probably tells us that it's that's an Intel Core. So Wireshark does this very neat little thing that it also tells us from the MAC address what type of machine you're sending your packets to from the MAC address itself. So it's coming from a Sophos 4C and going to an Intel core and the type is IPv4. So that was all about Wireshark. You can use it extraneously for packet sniffing and packet analysis. Packet analysis comes very handy when you are trying to actually figure out how to do some stuff like IDS evasion where you want to craft your own packets and you want to analyze the packets that are going into the IDS system to see which packets are actually getting detected as some intrusion. So you can craft your packet in a relative manner so that it doesn't get actually detected by the IDS system. So this is a very nifty little tool. We'll be talking about how you can craft your own packets just in a little while, but for now, let's move ahead.